Hi there, and welcome along to Classic 15. It's our bite-sized podcast with me, Jack Pepper, sitting down with stars and behind-the-scenes figures in the classical music world. This episode, we welcome Dr Anita Collins, an award-winning music educator, writer, researcher and speaker. Now, she is an expert advisor to government and music organisations on music learning and brain development. She's recognised around the world for her ability to translate the research of neuroscientists and psychologists for a really wide audience, from parents to students and their teachers. I began by asking Anita about a phrase that's often encountered in her work and studies in this area. I asked her, what is the music advantage? So the phrase came from the research where they were looking at what are are the advantages of being musically trained? And they used the word musician. Um, And it was a really easy one to say, you know, sort of from being a musician, what are the neural cognitive advantages that may come from that? And I liked the phrase, but I didn't like using the word musician because I find the word musician is quite, it's really interesting when you say, okay, who's a musician? And you start to get this really narrow idea of it's someone who's on a stage someone who is absolutely exceptional at what they do and someone who gets paid to do it. Now, that's an incredibly narrow version of what it is to learn music and why we should learn music. So I just took the phrase and changed it slightly and and my book became The Music Advantage. And so what are the headline statistics, if you like, the facts and figures around how music helps the brain? Maybe maybe the sort of the most surprising facts around oh, that, that's a tricky one <laughs> um I'm not surprised by them so that's very hard for me to to answer however I would say um musically trained people have 130 percent more gray matter in their brain that's the squidgy stuff that we see on you know CSI and all those sorts of things so it's basically it's more space and we don't have an extra bit of you know brain coming out here it just means that it's denser it has more folds in it which makes it sort of like a a really well-organised um, Swedish house. It's like Ikea in the best version of Ikea in our, in our brain. Um, so we have 130% more. We have around just under 30% more white matter. Now, white matter is... I like to explain it as the roads between all the grey matter. The grey matter is the buildings and the white matter is all the roads. So there's more um, white matter, which means that that's why musically trained people are really good when it comes to both creativity but also problem solving, divergent thinking, coming up with that third answer to a problem that no one else thought of. Um, It's just having more networks in the brain. It also means the brain is actually healthier through life because it has... Um, if something goes wrong, if there's an accident or there's something that happens within the brain, the brain has more roads and, and buildings to go, that's okay, we, we can't use this one over here at the moment, but we'll just divert everyone over this way. So those are some of the main things. But that then leads on to the musically trained brain works faster, it's more connected, it's more consistent, it's more synchronised, and through all of those things it's healthier. So is there a right or optimum age to start? There's two ways to, every question you're going to go, I'm going to go, well, sort of, but let me explain. (laughs) (laughs) Um, There there was originally research, they used music to understand if there was a, if there are stages in brain development, meaning do we go through kind of evolutions of our brain, this whole idea that actually our brain is always changing and growing and it's not static. And they kind of used it to find that there is a sensitivity period for the, uh, in the first seven years of life, which Anyone who's raised a child would know that they're sponges till about seven and then about seven or eight, they're kind of flatline for a little bit and that's a thing called neural pruning. The brain goes, I'm full, I need to make some room and it goes in like a hoarder's house and goes chuck, 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 out it goes and it makes space for the next lot of learning. However, since they've sort of looked into that, then they've then gone, okay, let's try this in our 30s and our 40s and our 80s and our 70s. And what they've then found is that actual music learning at any age will still have the same sorts of benefits no matter when you start, which is a a fascinating idea that it's it's an activity that can be beneficial all the way through life. To me, it's a bit like exercise. If you haven't been exercising and then you suddenly begin, as long as you do it in an appropriate way for your age, it will be beneficial for your body. Music learning is exactly the same for your brain. And say a young musician listening is really stressed or indeed angry maybe you might get angry that you've been going through lots of auditions and lots of uh, exams and competitions and you're angry how do you deal with that emotion as a musician is that something that you 
do you channel that musically? What, how would you suggest dealing with, say, an emotion like that? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a, a highly human emotion, no matter where you are, that sort of rejection, sense of disappointment, you know, really trying to achieve something. And that's one of the, the pluses of music learning is it actually is one of the few things that builds resilience and persistence in our brains. There, it isn't just a feeling, it's actually a network in our brain that goes, no, no, I can see that there's a really long-term goal here and I'm going to work very, very hard to do that. And I recognise there's going to be ups and downs along the way. It doesn't stop us or from experiencing those emotions, but I think we can recognise them earlier and understand that they have a life cycle so that, you know, this too will pass. Today I got, you know, I found out I didn't get into, didn't pass that audition that I was trying to do. Don't feel great today, but I know tomorrow I'll go to, I'm going towards the greater goal. And I think that's ideally, that's what persistence and resilience is, is understanding that there's a, there's a wave of these things and we will ride that wave, not feel that it's going to be terrible all the time. And you advise in this space all the time with in terms of educational institutions, governments, the idea of music teaching, music learning. What do you find is the most common mistake in terms of, you know, maybe it's the way music is taught or the advice that you give, the thing that surprises governments and educational institutions? What would you say is the thing people often get wrong? Oh, there's so many. I think of them as myths. So there's a lot of mythical understanding. It's this idea of talent. So this black and white, you're musical or you're not is one of the first big ones that comes in. We now know that everyone is musical from birth because we use our music processing network to learn how to speak language. Like they're at, they're absolutely connected from birth and actually music processing grows language processing. So we're all actually musical from birth. So this idea that of of talent and that it's a yes or a no versus it's the same sort of thing if you say to someone are you musical or can you sing or can you not sing as opposed to can you sing in tune or can you sing but maybe not in tune then you get a totally different, different answer he said I sound great when I sing in the shower my goldfish loves it um but singing in tune is a different thing so I think there's a myth about that um I think there's a myth about the idea that you should only get stu- children to learn music if they are interested if they show an interest And I find that a really difficult thing to deal with because it's like how is a child meant to show an interest in something that they may never have experienced? Like they need to hold instruments, they need to play things, they need to sing, they need to move to music. They need to do all those things to figure out if they're truly interested in following it as opposed to being explained or hearing it on a radio and then going, do you like music? And they go, "Mm, not really. So I think that's one of the biggest things that I deal with as well. Music is a core part of how we become the humans we grow into. It's actually it's the reason why we as humans are the only species that has music. We use it to grow our brains. It's one of the most important mechanisms. Therefore, music learning sits within that growing, productive, happy, healthy humans. Um, so that's a really hard thing to get across to people. And I think also the last one I'd say is getting governments and teachers and leaders and policymakers to understand that it is a progressive, long process. It's not a quick fix. It's not a have fun every Friday afternoon and that's music learning. It actually has to be doing it in a particular kind of way to get the benefit that you're looking for. Does one country get it particularly right, have you found? Um, Not at the moment. And the reason I would say, I mean, the Scandinavian countries are really fascinating because A, they value music learning. B, they have a highly musically trained population which means that that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. They they get musically trained as kids. They grow up. They have children. They tra- musically train their children. You know, it's, it just goes around in circles. Um, so that's a really important thing, and they do do that very well. But the reason I say not at the moment is because music is seen as a very expensive part of education. I almost said hobby because a lot of people see it as this add-on or extra. If we've got the spare money, that's what we'll do. And I think my work is trying to say, actually, it's fundamental to growing the young brain. Therefore, it's an absolutely vital thing to do. And a lot of the issues we're having with literacy, numeracy, um, our executive function, self-regulation in kids could be mediated by music and music education, I should say. And we should be putting money into it for that reason at the moment, if we need an excuse, but will actually benefit so many other things. So I think we're struggling because of the the economic situation that a lot of the world is in at the moment. So regularity is one key. 
and linking it with other subjects. What would you say if you were sort of giving a point plan, if you like, your your headline advice? How do you build that in realistically? Narrow it down for me. What age of student would you like me to do that for? Well, if we if if we sort of to to build a young musician, really. So if we're speaking about the early years up to sort of well, it's probably too broad to say up to twelve or thirteen. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I can do that one. I think the the it begins with um, parent education and an understanding that singing to your child is actually the first way of connecting with them, but also the first way to teach them language. Uh, then having free music lessons for all parents, the parent involved and the child is involved. It has to involve singing, moving, and using an instrument or making music outside your body. Then moving into um, sort of school age children where they've got um, music, preferably a little bit of music every single morning. I often say if there's 50 minutes, if you've got 50 minutes in your timetable per week, it is far more effective with young children to have 10 minutes at the start of every morning than 50 minutes on Thursday afternoon. Then I would have them, you know, moving into learning um, violin is particularly my choice of instrument for a lot of different reasons, um, around the age of six, moving into the age of seven. They would also have singing that goes with it. As they get into their adult teeth a little bit bigger when they're eight, nine and ten, moving into wind and brass instruments. So basically having music all the time, every day, all the way through. I get worried about the one second one you mentioned, which is teaching using music to teach other subjects or using music in other subjects. There's a difference between, to me, that's a musical experience. The important part is actually using music as an education for the brain and it gets supplemented or added to by musical experiences but shouldn't be in place of it, if that makes sense. And is that, would your advice be different if we were looking at, say, a sort of early career musician? So somebody who's late teens, early 20s, somebody who's then looking to really get established in the professional music making world. As you say, as you said at the beginning, that's a very different definition of, of musician there. Um, what, would, what would your advice be to a late teenager, early 20s in terms of how to really make the most of that? Yeah, if they're looking into going into the profession, part of it is um, and having mentors, having people around you who can support you, people you can watch and observe and learn from, having really good music teachers. And what I mean by that are teachers that develop the whole person. Um, it's Music teaching is an incredibly old profession. It's older than so many other. The master and apprentice model of I can play violin like this, so then you follow me and copy me and you play violin like this. Because of that, we have had a tendency to teach as we were taught. So in many cases, we haven't necessarily thought or changed how we teach too much. And I think that's something that we really need to work on with the students of today and the musicians of tomorrow that are coming through is actually developing the whole person so that they can have long and fruitful and joyful and enriching careers because they're seen, they're developed as a person as well as a musician. They're not two separate things. And I think as I work with a lot of orchestral musicians all around Australia in most of the orchestras, and that it's really, really important as they go through the different stages of their career that they have that basis of why am I doing this, how can I learn and how can I teach myself, but also how can I branch out, use that wonderful creativity I have in my head in all sorts of different kinds of ways. This could be a horrible final question, Anita, but is there a line that we could live by as musicians, as a practising composer myself or as a sort of professional musician, early career musician? uh, Is there a sort of a mantra maybe that you find is really sort of true or apt and helpful for musicians to live by? I don't know. The one that came to my head is um, it draws on the Ted Lasso idea of, you know, football is life, but music is life, but also life is music. And keeping that love of of it is a really important one. Um, Also seeing ourselves as artists, but not being ruled by our art, I think is a really important thing. And that art can live anywhere. I'm, I'm a classically trained musician wanting originally wanting to head into an orchestra but then looked at that life and went you know what that life is not going to work for me and enrich me but how can I use my musical training in a way that's going to be fulfilling and what I ended up doing was becoming a music educator and I had one of those you know Wagner-esque moments where the light you know the 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 clouds opened, the light came down and I heard like angels and I went, this is what I should be doing. My musical training has led me towards this place within the music industry and music education industry for me, but it is within the music industry. So 
opening yourselves up for for as many experiences as possible i think is is the best way to go and remaining open all the way through your life because one of if i go back to the research the biggest area that is developed in the terms of the five big personalities is openness to experience musically trained people are very enriched by and open to experience so keep that openness to experience going wherever you can find it in your life. I was going to say a horrible pun there, but that's like sound advice from Dr. Ah, Anita Collins. (laughs) (laughs) Dr. Anita Collins, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. It's been great. Thanks so much for joining us for this edition of Classic 15. All the episodes in the series can be heard on the usual podcast platforms and on Classic's website, classic.com. Head there too for the latest opportunities and video on demand. And if you want an up-to-the-minute radar, follow Classic on social media at Classic Music. Thanks so much for joining me, Jack Pepper, and hopefully we will meet again in another Classic 15 before long.